Hi again, everyone. We're ready for Julia's keynote now. In many ways, we wouldn't even be assembled here today if it weren't for Julia Anglin's work. Uh, online privacy had been simmering at the uh, periphery of the public imagination for most of the 2000s until uh, the uh, path-breaking Wall Street Journal series that Julia led called What They Know, and which I already alluded to uh, in my talk earlier today, just cracked this issue wide open and brought it to the forefront of the public imagination. It's had a huge impact on online privacy. It spurred a lot of the research on, uh, in computer science topics that we heard about today and we will continue to hear about. And also what I find very cool about the series is that it really combined a team of journalists with a team of technologists, and I think this is a, a model for uh, doing this kind of uh, investigatory work going forward. And in fact, the team won, uh, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in investigatory reporting uh, for that series. And uh, Julia, in fact, has a track record of doing such work. Way back in 2003, uh, her team again won a Pulitzer for uh, its investigation of corporate corruption. Another thing I find very cool about her work is that it has not only depth, but also a lot of breadth. Her recent book, Dragnet Nation, brought together the idea of uh, online tracking by private companies and government surveillance and other type of tracking, as well as privacy tools you can use to protect yourself into one very coherent, readable narrative. She's now moved on to ProPublica from the Wall Street Journal, where at ProPublica she continues to do a really awesome work, and today she's gonna give us an overview of uh, privacy issues from her perspective. Let's welcome Julia. Thank you um, for that great introduction, Arvind. And um, this is a delight for me to be here because um, I'm really a technologist, a wannabe technologist at heart. And so I feel um, particularly happy in this crowd. And um, I'm going to talk about um, what I facetiously call the issue formerly known as privacy. And um, it will be revealed what I mean by that um, as we go through this. Uh, I want to just say that some of this might be a review for you who might be familiar with some of the what they know work or my book, but um, I'm hoping you'll bear with me and that if nothing else, I'm trying to bring the fun back to privacy, so um, it'll be amusing. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, I'm going to just start with um, who am I and what, what do I even have to bring to the table here. So. Um, I grew up in uh, Palo Alto. My parents were both in technology in during the computer revolution, which was a very exciting time in the 70s and 80s. And um, if left to my own devices, I probably would have become uh, a technologist. My first computer was this one. <laughs> um, I learned to program BASIC in fifth grade uh, because Steve Jobs actually had a program in the Palo Alto schools to, as an experiment to teach kids to program. I never touched a typewriter in my life. And so I always sort of laugh at people who say, oh, the digital natives, and you have this young millennials. I'm like, no, 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 hello. I'm the first. I want, I want that title, digital native. Um, so I, um, I was going to be actually in the technology industry. I worked at Hewlett Packard in my summers in college, and I studied math. And I actually thought that my natural progression would be to go on to Hewlett Packard. But I also worked on my campus newspaper at the University of Chicago, and I just thought it was really fun. So I thought, I'll just go into that for a little while, and then I'll come back. <laughs> and I never came back, but I came back in a, in a different way, which was I joined the Wall Street Journal in 2000 to cover technology. And um, around 2009, I was covering something called MySpace that I thought was super interesting. Actually, it was 2007, if I recall. And I... Um, I left to write this book, Stealing MySpace, and um, I always joke that you know I was so right that social networking was going to be big, <laughs> and I was so wrong <laughs> about which network <laughs> to write a book about. Um, so, but anyways, it, you know the one thing that was um, worthwhile about doing this book, in addition to just the fact that it was a fun story, um, was that I, it started me thinking about how the technology industry had changed. So, I grew up in a world where you bought your technology at Fry's. I don't know if any of you guys have ever gone to Fry's, but it was like the big store, and you'd go there and you'd buy your software in boxes. It was shrink-wrapped, right? Or you would buy your hardware, and it was also in a box and shrink-wrapped. And when I was writing about these tech companies in the quote, now I guess it was called the Web 2.0 era, um, it occurred to me that they just had a very different business model. And we now know what that business model is, which is, nicely summarized by this saying that if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. So when I came back from the 
smashing success of my MySpace shit book, that's a joke, um, for, <laughs> to the Wall Street Journal. Um, from my, after my book leave, I thought, you know, I want to look into this business. Right? I knew MySpace was basically scraping the data from the profiles that its members created and, and using that as a lure for advertisers. And so I actually just had this very simple and honest question, which was, what do they know about me? Right? And I really just wanted to answer that question. And so I launched a, a series at the Wall Street Journal called What They Know. This was the day one launch, you know, the web's new gold mine, your secrets. Um, of course, I joke now that if it was going to launch this series, it would be called What Don't They Know? <laughs> right? And it would be like a list like of four things, and like each year, one more would get knocked off. Um, you know, and it's worth pointing out that you know one of my very my my co-conspirator on this, Ashkan Sultani, is in the room. Um, the way I approached this was I I thought, what do they know? And then I sort of called around to a bunch of people who seemed like they'd done research on this. And I called Chris Hufnagel at Berkeley. And I said, you did this interesting study about tracking, web tracking, you know, I want to do something like that. And so he put me in touch with Oshkon, and I managed to hire Oshkon with some like money that the journal scrounged up as a contractor to, to launch this series. And we actually thought we were just going to do one story uh, about web tracking, and it actually ended up being a three-year long investigation. Um, our first story, though, was this one about web tracking. It was just like, wow, all these places are tracking you online. And this was dictionary.com. This was a visit of visiting 10 pages of the site would it enable two, more than 200 trackers. Um, and so just by showing the volume of tracking, we actually were able to um, really surprise people. I think both Oshkan and I felt like it wasn't going to be that revelatory a series because we knew this tracking was going on. But in fact, it turned out the readers had no idea. And so it spurred my editors to say, we want way more like this. So we did a lot of stories. I'm going to just summarize a few of them. One of the ones I'm most proud about is this one about app, apps. We tested, this was back in the 2010, we were talking about which apps were leaking your data. And it was an early, you know, one of the earliest stories about this. I think most people still had the idea that when you were using the app, you weren't on the network, right? You'd already downloaded it, so why would it be transmitting? Um, but in fact, as we know, they are. Not always, and in some ways, you know, what we found, if you see here, is that the device ID was often transmitted. There has been some efforts by both Google and Apple to mask that transmission, um, although I would argue they're not perfect. Um, and then after about a year of writing stories like that, we, um, <laughs> some people, I think it was at EFF, actually, were like, you know, uh, there are some like, other people in this tracking game you might want to look at, like the government. <laughs> and so we started looking into government surveillance. This was a catalog of um, spy tools that were being sold at a conference for governments to buy. Uh, that We snuck into this conference and got um, some of the documents, posted them online. And basically it was like you know tools for hacking, tools for intercepting, tools for facial recognition that governments could come and buy. But, um, were only available to basically governments and not to citizens. And it was pretty revelatory just to see the kind of stuff that was off the shelf available, right? Tools that 10 years earlier would only be available to an NSA were now a, a retail off the shelf market. Um, of course, I just have to say that in a pre, you know, it was a pre-Snowden, it was very exciting. Um, now, of course, it all looks like a peanuts. Um, and then, of course, um, we also found how there were a lot of people breaking the rules, right? So Google was placing some code in ads that um, would trick the Safari browser into allowing it to install a cookie. And Safari was set to default, not allow third-party cookies. So this actually ended up with Google paying a $22.5 million fine, I think remains the largest privacy fine that has been issued by the FTC, and is equivalent to five hours of Google revenue. Um, <laughs> just a fact. <laughs> um, so then we looked into, in the third year of our What They Know investigation, we started looking into impact. You know, people were starting to say to us, well, okay, fine, everybody's tracking everything. Well, what does it mean? Is it affecting my life? So one of the more surprising things that we found was that, you know, people were actually starting to see differential pricing online. So this was a study that took about nine months that Oshkan helped lead. Um, 
And we're looking at prices across the internet to see are you getting different prices. And Staples, it turns out, was doing different prices per zip code. And the zip code pricing was actually an interesting thing and had a very rational basis for it. it. It appeared to, which is that if you were near a competitor store within a certain mile range, they would give you the lower price. And if the, you were further away from a competitor store, you would get the higher price. And they basically had two prices for everything, from staplers to lockers to pallets of paper. And um, that seems sort of economically rational, but it's also worth pointing out that the people who live close to the competitor stores are richer and whiter. So essentially, the richer, whiter people were getting cheaper prices, and poorer, minority people were getting higher prices. And so we used to have a name for things like that called redlining. And I think we have to think about a world where you might end up with inadvertent types of redlining, and whether we as a society want to draw lines at what we think is a, a fair amount of that that will take will allow to take place. Um, and Staples wasn't the only one. This one is one of my favorites, Capital One. I think they still do this. Um, basically, in the HTTP traffic, which I don't think you can see, but it's the green text, and we've highlighted the white. In plain text, they would just send a little thing like the instant analysis, your downscale income, you have a lo some college education, right in the traffic between your website and their um, computers, and it would instantly provide the card that you know you might like best. And the, you know, this doesn't actually mean you can't get another card from them, but it's a steering. It's a way to steer you towards a card they think that you would like. And I think that's another question we have to raise as a society is there's going to be a lot of steering that goes on with pages that can literally create themselves. Web pages can create themselves dynamically, uniquely for every single person. That's a technical possibility. And so what amount of this type of steering are we are going to allow and what we think is fair? Um, and then, of course, there's the government, right? So one of the other consequences of um, surveillance being so cheap and so powerful is that the government has a lot more data about us than ever before. This is a photo of this guy who lives in San Rafael, California, and his kids getting out of their car, captured by an automatic license plate reader. So the local police go around, and they have these cameras up on the top of their cars and the hood, and they just scan, right? Everywhere they go, their photos are being taken of cars that are parked, cars that are oncoming, and obviously cars in, in driveways. And it's kept forever in some districts and some places have some data retention rules. But essentially, Mike katz Lacave has never had a police record before, right? He has never been arrested. He, you know, and now all of a sudden, like, he FOIA'd for his local police for his records and he found that they had captured photos of his car parked and GPS stamped for two, more than 200 times. So he, they had a record of where he was literally once a week for two years and including pictures of his kids, right? And so this is something that would normally not have occurred before ubiquitous surveillance became um, a reality. And then, of course, another impact is one of just human toll, right? So this is Bobby Duncan. She's a, she was a student at University of Texas, Austin. And she was not out about her sexual orientation to her parents, but she joined the queer chorus on campus. But that queer chorus had a Facebook group. And Facebook, at that time, had a policy that was buried somewhere maybe in the settings, that if you joined the group, even if it was sort of a semi-private group, it would automatically notify your friends about joining. So her, when she joined the queer chorus, her parents got an automatic notification that she had joined, and they stopped speaking to her. And so you know, this is sort of the human toll of not understanding where your data is going and having other people sort of in control of where your data goes. And of course, in this situation, you know, these things are always unclear. Could she have read and understood the Facebook privacy settings better? Maybe. But you know, the truth is, I spent my entire life trying to understand the Facebook privacy settings. <laughs> and <laughs> I literally have not been able to master it. I don't think it is totally masterable, because they change all the time. And you know, you often find out about these defaults after they have happened. So, um, so those are some of the impacts that we found in our reporting. So at that point, after three years of leading a privacy investigative team, I was starting to feel a little hopeless, right? You, is privacy dead? Was what Scott McNeely right when he said, you have no privacy, get over it, back in the 80s? Um, you know, and so I thought to myself, well, I wonder if the reporting I'm doing is actually making people feel more hopeless. Like, I'm actually contributing some sort of um, 
terrible thing where people are just going to give up, right? So I decided to do another type of an investigation, an investigation into whether there's any hope. <laughs> and so um, I wrote this book, Dragon Night Nation, that came out in February. And really, in this book, I decided to try to protect my privacy. Could it be done? And could it be done by someone who refuses to live in a cave or log off of the internet or, you know, do, this was not a like living biblically experiment. This was like, I'm a mom, I have a job, I have kids, and I want my devices. What can I do to get out of the drag net? So the first thing I did, had to do was sort of break up with Google. So I like Google, actually. They've been fairly decent and benevolent, it seems, in most ways, but um, they always give me the search results I want. They gave me free email, right? What's not to love? But I realized that they just had too much data about me. They had everything. They had every place I'd ever been. They seemed to, because I would use their maps. And then I, they had every email I'd ever sent, literally. They, you know, so it was, it was too tempting a target, if not for hackers, for the government, right? And we certainly have seen that the government finds that temptation irresistible. Um, the Snowden documents show that not only does the government show up with court, secret court orders for data from companies like Google, but also that they're willing to attempt some nefarious break-ins on the back end if they can't get it the way they want. So I um, switched to a privacy protecting search engine called DuckDuckGo. And um, if anyone here has used it, it's fine. You get the searches you want. You just have to work a little harder, right? So instead of it, you know, at first when I switched, I couldn't, I felt like really annoyed that I had to finish typing because you get so used to the idea that Google will just finish your sentences for you. And then I realized how lazy I had become, you know, <laughs> that I was feeling exhausted by this task of typing one extra word. Um, and uh, DuckDuckGo says that they don't keep any IP addresses. They don't seem to know who I am when I show up there. They give me the Natural History Museum from London every time, even though I live in New York. And um, so I find that kind of reassuring, actually. Um, and then, of course, I tried to block the ad tracking. So I use Disconnect. I also have used Ghostry. They're both good. And um, obviously, I'm adding Privacy Badger to the rotation, Peter. Um, so, uh, but you know, uh, that blocks the tracking that is known about. There's always going to be an arms race, though, between the trackers and the tracked. And so, um, I think that you know, all the research that suggests that they're going to find new ways. So I doubt that I'm entirely successful by using this. Um, leaving Gmail was really hard because there's actually no one out there really selling a privacy protecting email service that you can trust. There are people selling privacy protecting email services, but mostly overseas. And um, strangely, as much as we sort of feel weird about the NSA, they do have stri stronger protections for US residents and data in the US. So it is actually, in my opinion, um, a slightly better idea to keep your data here than to put it overseas where we've seen that they will basically do anything to get it. So I use Rise Up. Rise Up is, a, is run by a collective in Seattle. And it's not for everybody. It's, um, you have to sign their, their social mission in order to join, which involves being against um, a lot of different types of oppression, gender oppression, and I think capitalist oppression. And at the time, of course, I was working for the Wall Street Journal whose tagline was adventures in capitalism, right? And so <laughs> it did require some mental gymnastics for me to be able to honestly sign this thing saying that I was against capitalist oppression. But I decided, look, I'm against oppression. Just because I work for a capitalist, you know, promoting organization, I'm still against oppression. So. Um, but not everyone feels that they can make that agreement. Uh, and also, by the way, <laughs> Rise Up, you know, is uh, doesn't allow you a lot of storage, so you have to constantly download your emails, in the, like in the old days. So I, I always joke that I'm a data survivalist, stockpiling my emails at home. <laughs> so, um, and then I had to leave Google Docs, so I went to uh, Encrypted Cloud, Spider Oak, which um, costs actual money. Two hundred dollars a year is what I pay them to um, have an encrypted uh, cloud backup. But at least I know that I have the keys. Um, and then, of course, I had to deal with the social network. So Facebook, unfortunately, despite my feelings about how I couldn't manage my data on Facebook, I still felt like I needed a presence there. So I have this sort of blame page which says I'm not here. Um, you can find me other places. And I unfriended everybody. So I unfriended my mother. I unfriended all of my friends. And so just left this kind of weird shell uh, and um, basically just sort of pointing people somewhere else. 
I did completely leave LinkedIn, which caused me some concern. I thought maybe I'll never get a job again. Um, but in fact, I did, uh, since then, leave the Wall Street Journal and joined ProPublica, where I'm quite happy. So I think um, so far, fingers crossed, it hasn't um, harmed my future. But the problem of my phone was really kind of hard to solve. So the phone is basically the world's best tracking device. I mean, I don't know any spy would have dreamed to plant one of these things on their target. Not only does it, it communicate silently and without you being able to audit it with your cell phone carrier, a Wi-Fi signal, a Bluetooth signal, and your apps, right? Among, the, at least, and that's what I know about. There are probably maybe other things as well. And so the, my ability to control the data it sent out was actually very limited. There's not privacy protection the software I could put on my phone um, that would audit all the transmissions. And so I couldn't really tell what it was sending out. So that's where I ended up with a fake identity. So um, I created this um, identity, Ida Tarbell. She's a muckraking journalist from the turn of the century who is a heroine of mine. She wrote all the um, exposés about Standard Oil's abuse of its monopoly, which led to the strengthening of antitrust laws. And so I felt Ida wouldn't mind if I created an identity in her name. And in fact, I would like to say her biographer did write to me and say Ida would have been proud. So I felt good about that. <laughs> um, and so Ida, I decided she could have an identity um, that would help me get out of some of the tracking. So first thing is I got her an address. A friend of mine let Ida move in with her. Um, I got an uh, American Express card for Ida, which was sort of um, challenging at first. But as a concept, I thought, oh my god, how can I do that? But it turns out that you just get an, a card added to your own name, so it's as if it's your kid. So uh, American Express knows I pay Ida's bills, but it gives me that anonymity in a restaurant or somewhere. They don't have to know who I am. Of course, I obviously could have gone to cash, but I'm just too lazy for that. So, um, And I got an Amazon account for Ida because I thought I'm ordering a lot of books about the NSA, the Stasi, et cetera. And um, there's, you know, I'm going to end up on a watch list, although I'm sure I'm on it already. But um, might as well have them go to Ida's account. And I got her a phone. And I was feeling a little bad about the Google thing, so I got her an Android phone. Um, but the truth is that, you know, as actually Chris Seguin pointed out to me, me and Ida were not that different. We went to the same places, we called all the same people. And so in this era of tracking of behavior, right, we're really in a world where behavior is being tracked, not identity. And so even though I made this huge attempt to separate my behavior from my identity, in truth, my behavior was my tell. That was the thing that was going to always be uniquely identifiable about me. And so I really hadn't succeeded in masking my identity. Um, and so that's where I ended up in the sad situation of putting my phone in a Faraday cage which is you know, a bag lined with a thin amount of metal that just blocks the signal, which is super great for privacy, but actually not good for making phone calls. So, um, <laughs> so there I was, exactly where I didn't want to be living in a shed in the woods with no technology, right? So that was an unsuccessful experiment. The other unsuccessful experiment was data brokers, right? Though these companies used to be in the business of, making, of compiling and selling mailing lists, right? So that you would get junk mail. Now, of course, they sell their data into the online ad ecosystem as well, and they have so many more news sources of data about you. And so their dossiers are rich and comprehensive, and also there is no law requiring them to let you remove your data or app allow people to see their data. So I couldn't even find a really comprehensive list of data brokers. I, it took me a while to assemble the list I made of 212 data brokers. Of those, only 92 offered opt-outs. Many of them required extreme amounts of identity verification for an opt-out. And some of them actually wanted me to send a credit card number to opt-out, which I declined to do because that seemed really sketchy. <laughs> but um, many of them wanted driver's license, et cetera. So uh, I think, yeah, 65 of them wanted identifying, like an ID of some kind, mostly driver's license, to opt out. And so it's not a marketplace which is really consumer friendly. In the end, I opted out as, of as many as I could. But the truth is that actually now, only the bad actors have my data, right? So I basically opted out of the ones who are sort of like concerned enough about the consumer optics to offer an opt out. And I'm with the ones that are like shady enough that they don't even care 
that there's no opt-out. And I also only was able to see my data from 13 of them, but even that was disturbing. So of the 13 that I saw, they range from highly accurate to highly inaccurate. And actually, one in one case, within the same company. So at Axiom, they had three separate files on me that I looked at. One was based, mostly it seemed, on an online attributes, which basically was about my online shopping habits, which were correct, but their demographics based on what they guessed about me from those shopping habits was wildly incorrect. And then the paper file that they sent me in the mail after I sent them a check for $5, which really made me mad, um, was, uh, was basically just my name and address and was correct. And um, the most disturbing one was from a company called eBureau, which um, does alternative credit scores, they say. And that data actually showed, they had just decided that I was a single mother with low income and um, no educate, very little education. And um, I, th I don't know where they came up with that. That doesn't happen to be true. And the thing that bothered me was they said, well, this, you know, their website says this data would be used, for instance, at a hospital if they're trying to figure out, like, how much you could pay for their services. And I thought, well, the, this is, like, what I don't want to happen is to be, like, hit in a car crash and have the hospital be like, oh, she can't pay. Forget that, you know? <laughs> so um, obviously they have some obligation to treat you, but you still don't want faulty data out there, right? That's what Solon was talking about this morning, that it's not clear to me, having seen my data, whether I'm more upset about the correct data or the incorrect data. I think I'm upset about both of them, though, I've decided. <laughs> um, so at the end of my experiment, you know, what had I accomplished? I think that I was most likely, a generous interpretation would be that I was 50% successful. And I had spent an enormous amount of money. When I tallied it up, it was almost $2,500 for a year, right? I mean, think about a burner phone and then my email service, and I got some various encrypted apps and this and that, and my shredder and my one password service. So strangely, they didn't, and none of them seemed that expensive to begin with, but in fact, it was rather expensive. So then I started to wonder, is this, is privacy a luxury good only available for the rich? Is that something that we want to be true in this society? But then I had another question, which is actually, I didn't even get the privacy. So it's a worst kind of luxury good, right? It's like a fake, it's like a fake Louis Vuitton bag that you buy on Canal Street. <laughs> it's not the real thing. You know, I got out of some data brokers. I didn't get out of others. I really wasn't able to protect my privacy on my phone. I couldn't convince my friends to use encryption, which would have made our email messages secure. And I had no assurances that my tools worked. And in fact, I had some proof that some of them didn't. I paid two different services to opt me out of data brokers, and both of them failed to do the job. And I actually need, um, one of them shut down the service, actually, after I wrote about it. But the fact is that there is snake oil out there. And there will be more as people get more concerned about privacy. And until there are some assurances that your tools work, actually, I'm concerned about the emergency, emerging market for privacy tools. Because there's a lot of opportunity for you know, deceptive companies in a world where the product can't be verified. So, I realized that I had been searching for the wrong thing. I realized I had been searching for what we call privacy, but what I really wanted was assurances. I wanted the feeling I have when I get in a car. When I get in a car, I know it's dangerous. I know it's the number one killer of Americans. And yet, I feel completely confident getting in because I know that this car has to meet some safety standards. There's some baseline standards that all cars have to meet. And then, actually, if they screw up, they're in trouble. I get to sue them. They have to go to Congress and testify, and they must cry in front of Congress if, if possible. <laughs> and you know, there will be hearings, and it's you know, I have due process, right? That is really what I wanted. I wanted assurances that my data had met some sort of baseline minimum, and that I could tr buy my way up to the Volvo, and that I could sue them if something went wrong, right? This is America, this is what I wanted. <laughs> so I realized that I wasn't really looking for privacy. Privacy is like, I just wanna be alone, like close the bathroom door. It wasn't that. I wanna participate in the data economy. I want assurances. And we're not in a world where we have those. So really, I think we want justice. We want 
human rights. We want due process, right? That is what we stand for in this country. And if we can't see our data, and we can't see how it's being used, how can we know that we're getting that? And so that is why I think we should not call it privacy. I made a symbol for it. <laughs> the issue formerly known as privacy. I borrowed this from Prince, the artist formerly known as Prince, although I think he's gone back to Prince. But um, I don't have the right name for this, but I think that one way to have the conversation about the issue formerly known as privacy is to talk about due process. And I'm happy to take questions. So I have two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one was that during your talk you mentioned about potentially having the data in another country, and then you said that it's actually better to have it here because in other countries uh, people can get them. So I was wondering if you have any specific examples, because coming from Europe I know that there are more laws, inefficient as they be, uh, that they are protecting or trying to protect users, like the EU cookie law, where every side has to tell you that you're using cookies. Right. Uh, and the second question is that, you know, you went to extreme lengths to hide yourself. So I wonder what portion of it would you advise, uh, you know, an everyday person to, to try to do the same like you, and what portion would you say is just too much? Okay, two hard questions. Okay, so I'll start with um, Europe. Uh, this is a debatable point, right? There, great minds can disagree about whether you should keep your data abroad or in the US. But I think that essentially what we're seeing is in terms of government surveillance, governments are more interested in surveilling outside their countries than in, right? And NSA has great capabilities, as we have seen. And they have really no legal bar to surveillance outside the US. And we have seen they're very aggressive in Europe, even with allies, right? They're very aggressive. And so I felt that even though the NSA has also been caught doing, capturing a lot of US data with their phone calling data program and other programs, that I still felt that being behind the shield of the US borders gave me a little bit of legal protection. That is not true in the commercial arena, which you were talking about. So Europe does have stronger commercial privacy laws. But that's a different question, because commercial privacy is mostly US companies, right? And so Europe's ability to enforce those laws has actually been quite limited. They, for instance, as you probably all know, didn't, you know, the Google's privacy policy change actually was not in compliance with the EU data protection laws, but when the EU came to them and said, look, this is a problem, you need to adjust to our laws, Google said, stuff it, you know? And so the EU gave them a paltry 150,000 euro fine and everybody moved on. And I think that that is largely because the European countries don't have jurisdiction over Google. Google doesn't have an office there, and so um, what can they really do? They don't have an ability to enforce commercial privacy the way that the US does. And the US does do a decent job on enforcement of commercial privacy, but only because only within this very narrow band of deception. The only commercial privacy law we have is this FTC's you know, consumer deception law. So if a company is not deceptive, if they say, I'm going to invade your privacy, and then they do, there's, it's hard to make a case. Your second question was, what should a regular person do amongst my things? Some of the things I did were really easy, and I didn't put all of them here, but switching to DuckDuckGo is a simple one. Using the Tor web browser is a simple thing that a lot of people can do. The most important thing, actually, is something that's really boring, but actually really important, is strong passwords. So when I actually spent a lot of time working on my password strategy, and I recommend to everybody that if they're going to focus on one password, it needs to be their email password, because it can be reused to reset all their accounts, and they should make it as long as humanly possible. And I also recommend people use password management software to create passwords, because it's too mentally taxing to come up with really strong passwords for all your sites. More questions? I actually have a question for you, which is that uh, your accounting of the costs uh, have the explicit costs, but not perhaps the 
the cost of time spent on these procedures and opportunity costs and so on. Um, would you make a different recommendation when those costs are taken into account? Is that going to get easier as people get more practice, perhaps, in adopting these technologies? Yeah, that's a good question. So that was just the money I paid out. But in fact, I spent countless, countless hours, months and months of my time on protecting my privacy. It's not something that a normal human should or could do, right? I did it in part to demonstrate how this was a sort of false choice. This idea that we've all, quote, given up our privacy because we just don't care is actually uh, not true, right? It's not really possible. It's not practical for a normal person to make really um, <laughs> privacy protecting choices in our world. And so it was partly a demonstration project. However, I would say though that I think what is going to happen is sort of like, I sometimes make this canned food analogy, right? So when it first became possible to can food, everyone was like, oh my God, this is so awesome and so convenient, right? And there were like all those recipes, you open this can, you open that can, you pour it in, right? And everyone's like, this is a great time saving thing. And then of course everyone was like, you know, maybe these vegetables aren't as tasty and they're not really as good for you. And we got into this like, oh, artisanal, like let's make our own and go to the farmer's market thing. And I feel like that's sort of where we are with technology, right? It's so incredible. It's like we just woke up and like the whole world literally is at our fingertips. And so we've been in an orgy of canned food, right? Of like, I just want all this, everything, all the access all the time, right? But I think we're gonna get to a more sort of artisanal world where we're gonna be willing to work a little harder on things that matter to us, right? So for some people, it will be using really cumbersome encryption pro programs. And for some people, it will be using DuckDuckGo, which takes a little harder to find your search results. But I think we're gonna have to become more conscious consumers of technology. And start eating our digital vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, there's two people at once here. Oh, I have just a general question, which is since now we are not shooting at privacy, but more at uh, due process and justice, uh, what do you recommend that as a science, computer scientist bring to uh, to the community as tools to help you? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, so. The question was just what should the computer science community do to help like illuminate this question of due process? And I think that actually it's basically what you guys have been discussing all morning. I think the burden on journalists like myself and on computer scientists who are looking at this issue, right now the, the public is sort of aware that there's tracking. But they are not sold, in my opinion, on the idea that it matters. And so I think we have a lot of work to do to show how it affects them. And I think that that's super hard work. And I don't know how long it will take to play out. But it did take a long time, by the way, to learn that fresh vegetables were better for you than canned. And, um, you know, and so I think we have to do the scientific work t to show that. And so I don't know exactly what the right answer is, but I hope you all throw yourself into that task. <laughs> so you said something about it's the uh, high income people or the well to do people who can buy what's necessary to ensure their privacy while the lower class individuals or working class or however you define it, and I want to know how you define it, uh, don't have the uh, resources or the interest perhaps to try to maintain their privacy. So taking that context, companies who are looking to get information about people, aren't they going to concentrate on the high income professional people and not even worry about the you working class? Or how does that work? I mean, where do they draw the line in where they expend funds to right. determine uh, uh, the, the situation with individuals? Well, in our fabulous capitalist economy, um, there are companies that focus on all the different segments. And unfortunately, one thing that I worry about a lot is there are companies who are in the business of exploiting vulnerable people, right? We have seen that with the financial crisis, like people who didn't weren't sophisticated enough to read the loans and see the exploding balloon payments. And um, we have seen things like sucker lists, which are like they send uh, really enticing offers in the mail to people who have literally have Alzheimer's and hope that they fill it out. And so what I, I think um, 
I think there will be good actors who will just focus on, you know, getting me to trade up from like the medium price sweater to the high price sweater, and I may not be that concerned about it. But I think there are uh, people who will target vulnerable people, and this expansive amount of data about all of us will very will make that job a lot easier. Finding those people, I think, will bu they'll be able to build sort of the ultimate sucker list of people who can be exploited. So, uh, it's very interesting examples. Um, I, I, I think there are some, you kind of have two observations. One is that like the data has some value uh, to to people who want to advertise to you, and the other is that certain people, you at least, are, are willing to take steps to protect or control. Um, your data. Um, so, so my question on that is to, sort of putting those two things together. The data is valuable and uh, you want some control over it. Um, so if we could control our data, do you think we could sell it? So, yeah. um, and if we were selling our data directly to the advertisers, maybe that could have some positive effects, i.e. direct money in our pockets. Maybe some of these more nefarious, shady tracking mechanisms would just go away because if I could sell it to the advertiser, they wouldn't have to kind of go underground to try to get it, and I would know about it, right? Because I'd be selling it. I I, I have looked into this. There are a lot of uh, companies that have explored this and tried this, and it is sort of a utopian ideal that maybe we could just reclaim our data and sell it directly and cut out the middleman. The problem with that is there's no scarcity of your data. So there is no reason for them to pay you for it when they could just get it other places. The number of tracking companies out there is in the hundreds, right? So how would you reclaim it from all of them, protect it, and then resell it back to them when every single day there's a new way for them to circumvent whatever way you know to reclaim it? So that is the problem. Uh, in Europe, there are people who have tried this because they have slightly better laws that allow you to opt out of commercial data brokers. And so you can actually remove all your data from all of the data brokers and try to resell it. But so far, most of those efforts have not gone anywhere, even with the strength of laws. And here in the US, without those laws, it, I think it'll be even more difficult. Wouldn't it be that, <clears throat> that you can that the ho hope is that I can undersell the data companies. After all, they must, after all, they're spending something to get my to get my data. Where all I need need to do is bother is bother to email. You know, I wish you could undersell it, but I'm sorry to report how little your data is being sold for right now. <laughs> it is a fraction of a tenth of a cent uh, at <laughs> best, and that's at best. So. The problem is that this data is very cheap to collect in bulk. And um, so your individual data is, is n there's no marginal cost for them to collect it. That's the problem. So I, you would be hard pressed to undersell them. Because David, and David Brin has an idea of social surveillance. Yes, right. So Moving David. Back at people. Yeah. I what, so David Brin and I have discussed this, and um, we have agreed to disagree. But basically, surveillance is the idea that if we, that surveillance, ubiquitous surveillance is coming, there's nothing we can do about it. But the only way to keep it in check is to watch the watchers as much as they watch us. His point is. As long as we can control the cameras that are trained on us just as much as the police or the government can, we will have all the benefits of surveillance. Like we could look around the corner while our daughter is walking home to make sure she's getting safe, home safely. But the truth is that we have not seen that our government is super excited about sharing their surveillance uh, powers with us, right? In fact, what I'm concerned about is the opposite, that we are going to see a wave of criminalizing counter surveillance techniques, right? Already, the NSA has said that using techniques such as TOR to obscure yourself or using cryptography is a sign of suspicion and something that shouldn't be allowed. And so the thing is, they want total transparency on us, but I have not seen the same willingness for them to let us surveil them. And until such time as we have a power structure that allows that, I think surveillance remains a utopian dream. 
if I could follow up on Nick's question actually about selling data and incentivizing uh, uh, services for doing so. So uh, you were talking a little bit earlier about the fact that data uh, that they have, oftentimes these data brokers have, oftentimes is wrong. It's not quite right. It has lots of noise, right? They get data, you know, there's no shortage of data, but data is hard to interpret and, you know, it's noisy. So it's, it's not high quality data. In contrast, if you were to sell it, right, and if there were some ways to ensure that that data was actually accurate, then that could constitute, you know, an incentive for services, right, uh, you know, to go to you uh, as opposed to those data brokers that have much noisier uh, data. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah. would, would, would And some be? of the companies that have started um, have started with exactly that premise. And I can't account for why, but it, they have all failed, right? So th the fact is that it turns out that when you're in the business of marketing, that the noisiness, you're, you're basically spraying out there a bunch of information. And so like, yeah, it's like 25% better, 25% worse. I mean, that's why the data isn't that good quality to begin with. And so it doesn't appear that they're willing to pay a premium for that. Now, I do think that kind of, Thing could change, right? Somebody like Google could come in and turn the switch and just be like, change our whole business model, and like, and they have enough data that is so entirely unreplicable that maybe they, of all people, not that I'm suggesting I want this to happen, but I just think that it is um, an interesting concept that maybe if a big player tried it, but small players have tried it repeatedly, and just all I can report to you is it's not working yet. <laughs> well, you may not want your data to be too accurate, it seems to me. Uh, if you have completely honest players out there, yes, you do, because um, the, the objective of all advertising is to target as tightly as you can. You can't advertise some oddity on the uh, Super Bowl. It's too expensive. You have to, to target. This has always been the objective of advertising. It's always been a frustration in advertising that you can't do that very effectively. So now they're trying to do it with all this uh, online information. Um, so maybe you don't want that because of the scale. Now, if you were living in a small town, everybody would know everything about you, right? But, and, and only one good enemy it could make your life miserable or worse in a small town. So it's almost the worst possible thing, but when you're in the whole international community, the, the, the scale of, of what could be known about you might, might be quite uh, hazardous, it seems to me. Right. Well, I do, um, I do advocate using a lot of obfuscation techniques. So, for instance, every single website that asks you to log in, I have a program that automatically creates a new fake email address for each one, right? And so there are steps you can take to obfuscate your data. But I guess my basic feeling is that if this devolves into a technological arms race, I'm always going to be under-equipped, right? I'm underfunded compared to the companies that are in the data business. They are the largest companies, the best funded companies in the world. And so, you know, my ability to obfuscate my data is going to be always limited and always sort of behind the times. Um, I will say this, that there are really good people who have devoted their life to trying to build these kind of obfuscation techniques. And the sad thing for them is that they don't get paid, right? A lot of this is like open source, free software movement, people who are volunteering their time. And so one thing I do believe strongly in is donating towards every one of those bits of free software that I use to support them. Because we also have to, to bear some burden on ourselves that we have chosen to live in this world of getting everything for free, and we want everything for free. But in truth, it's not free. And so I decided I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and pay for the things that I really value, which is why my bill is so high. <laughs> thank you, Julia. Let's uh, thank Julia again for the wonderful <laughs> Uh, ten minutes for a quick break before we assemble for our afternoon panels. <laughs>